and whatever was in that egg didn't come out. So the bunny threw a rock at it. But because he's only a little bunny, it was a little rock, and he didn't throw it very hard, so the egg didn't hatch. <sighs> pick, 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 pick. Squish, 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 squish. Something was trying to get out. That bunny sat very still, and he watched that egg. And he was very, very still, and he listened, and again he heard, pick, 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 scratch, 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 scratch. But nothing hatched out of the egg. Oh, how do you think that bunny feels right now? I bet he's getting a little tired of this. So finally, the bunny began to yawn, and he yawned, and he yawned, and the egg got very quiet. So the bunny curled up, and he was all warm, and he fell asleep. And while he was sleeping, something happened. What do you think happened to that egg while that bunny was sleeping? It hatched. And what does that mean when it hatches? That means it opens up and the little animal inside comes out. Oh, what do you think it is? Let's see, we're gonna find out. Oh, pick, 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 peck, 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 cracky, cracky, crack. Out came a little yellow duck. Oh, what is this, said the yellow duck. What is this furry thing? And the little bunny was sound asleep. So you know what the duck did? He wanted that bunny to wake up. So guess what he did? Oops, he thought and thought about who this could be. When I was in that egg, I didn't know there was somebody out here. I thought I was all alone. But now I'm not, and I want this thing to wake up. So he pushed the bunny with his foot. Oh, then oh, he jumped on the bunny, and he threw a rock at the bunny, and then he rolled the bunny down the hill. Oh, no. Why is he doing this? Why is he doing this to the bunny? Because he wants him to wake up, right? Is that how you wake up a bunny? Never. You could pat the bunny on his head and say, wake up, bunny. But you don't ever do this to a bunny. And you know what's kind of funny about this? Is this the same thing that the bunny did to the egg? It is. So it's kind of funny. Well, finally, the bunny woke up. And you know what he said? He said, where's my egg? Oh, <gasps> the egg's gone, isn't it? Where is the egg? Never mind that, said the bunny, said the duck. It doesn't matter. We're not alone anymore. We both have a friend. We don't have to be sad. We have a family. <gasps> so how do you think the bunny feels now? Is he happy? Because he has a family. He's not all alone in the world. And the duck isn't all alone either. They've made a family. The end. <gasps> I hope you like that book. And now I have one more fun thing that we are going to do. We just talked about an animal that hatches out of an egg. What animal did we learn from this book that hatches out of an egg? A duck, right? Well, I have some more eggs. And we're going to learn about other animals that can hatch out of eggs. Now, these are not real eggs. These are Easter eggs. Real animals don't hatch out of eggs that look like this. But this is all I have. So we have to make the best of it. All right, what do you think could be in this egg? Hmm, let's see what's going to hatch out of this egg. You ready? You ready to see what it is? Oh, <gasps> what is it? It's a snake. Did you know that snakes lay eggs and little baby snakes hatch out of eggs? Hmm, pretty cool. All right, let's see what's in this orange egg. I wonder what it is. Sounds like something little. What's little that might hatch out of an egg? Let's see. Oh, <gasps> It's a little baby chick. Did you know that baby chickens come out of eggs, just like the eggs that you eat for breakfast in the morning? Chickens come out of eggs. All right, let's see. Ooh, we have a pink egg. Oh, this one sounds like it's empty. Let's see, I hope it isn't. Oh, what is it? An alligator. Did you know that alligators lay eggs? And little baby alligators come out of the eggs. Oh, we have a purple one. Let's see what's in this egg. Oh, a spider. Did you know that spiders come out of eggs? 
The mama lays has she has an egg sack full of little tiny spiders. Hmm. I wonder what's gonna hatch out of this egg. Let's see what it is. <gasps> it's a sea turtle. <gasps> Did you know that turtles hatch out of eggs? If you go to Florida, the mamas come up on the beach there and they lay their eggs in the sand. And then they go back into the water and swim away. And those babies have to come out all on their own and make it to the sea. Who else hatches out of an egg? Let's see. Oh, we know this one. This is a duck. We learned that ducks hatch out of eggs. Oh, here's another pretty pink one. Let's see. Oh, did you know that fish lay eggs? Fish hatch out of eggs. Let's see this one, something heavy. Oh, did you know that dinosaurs laid eggs? Those must have been some really big eggs. And we have one more. This one's my favorite. Did you know that an octopus can lay hundreds, tens of thousands of eggs? Wow, that's a lot of babies. Well, that is all of our eggs. And I hope that y'all enjoyed this lesson learning about animals that hatch out of eggs. We learned about alligators, dinosaurs, snakes, ducks, chicks, spiders, turtles, fish, an octopus, and lots of other animals hatch out of eggs. Thank you so much for watching this video. And be sure to watch lots more videos like this one. See you soon. Bye. It doesn't often snow in southern Louisiana, but if you're looking for a cool reprieve on a hot summer day, look no further than Snow Wizard. Let's take an inside look at how this New Orleans original has been keeping cool for over 75 years. What started out as a corner grocery treat invented by George Ortolano in post-depression New Orleans has since developed into an icy empire serving hundreds of customers every day. From fabrication to flavor, this company does it all. He wanted to do something better than the snow cone. He wanted to produce a snow similar to that that came from a hand shaver, which was pushed across a top of a block of ice, which was used in the old time ice boxes at the time. So that's what inspired him to make his electric machine, which he called the Snow Wizard Snowball Machine. The difference Ronnie's uncle made between the snow cone and the snowball is more than just a name. It has to do with the way the ice is shaved down to soft snow-like flakes. The texture is achieved by machines such as the Snow Wizard. That's what made the difference. Once he started serving this popular treat, you have a snow cone or a shaved ice on the tongue, you know which one's going to taste better. And you don't want to go back to that crunchy snow cone once you've had a snowball. Flavor is yet another feature that sets Snow Wizard apart from the competition. You have to have a good flavor, which means the flavor base is simple syrup. One can't skip on the amount of sugar that's going into their simple syrup. The number one flavor among customers, and it's always been number one, is strawberry. By far, it's the best seller over every other flavor. The trip from the manufacturing floor is a lot closer than you'd think. You don't have to go far to get a hold of this native delicacy. At the Snow Wizard shop on Magazine Street, Customers come from all over the city to enjoy these delicious creations. Strawberry, have a wonderful day. I have worked at the Snowball Stand for seven years. My favorite thing about working here is all the people I work with and the customers that come all the time. As a longtime employee, Sam has personally witnessed the unity of this neighborhood around the common craving for a cool treat to beat the summer heat. So people come from all over on magazine to come to Snow Wizard. Mom and Dad come out here and bring their kids. I like to see the kids smile after we give them the snowball. Though the journey from start to finish is long when creating the snowball, the smile on the customer's faces makes every step worthwhile. As many can agree, this tasty treat is a significant part of our New Orleans culture. Whether you're local or just passing through, it's easy to fall in love with this sweet summer classic. It's really an iconic dessert, and I'm proud to take over where my uncle left off. It's, it's really one of those 
unique things such as pralines, gumbo, poor boys, snowballs is one of those iconic foods and I love it. It really snows! <laughs> Blimey! Where's my risotto? The trip from the manufacturing floor is a lot closer to the thing you blah 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 blah. I'm not repping blondes well. No! <laughs> hey there, T-Rex, what are you up to? A lesson? Who are you doing a lesson with today? Oh, hey guys, how are you? I'm sorry I didn't see you there. My name is Miss Emmerich, my students call me Miss E, and I'm an STPPS fourth grade teacher this year. And it looks like I showed up at a great time because you guys are about to complete a lesson on prepositions and prepositional phrases. Now I know some of you probably feel like you are really great at that already. You were at home reading books and magazines that have prepositions and prepositional phrases in them. You're journaling and writing letters to friends and you're using them. And I know that tons of you are having conversations at home that are filled with prepositions and prepositional phrases. Some of you probably feel like preposition pros already. Oh, we have our first question, yes. What are prepositions and what are prepositional phrases? Those are great questions. Thank you so much for asking. The best way for me to describe a preposition is it's one word and it's kind of like a connector or a link between nouns and pronouns and the rest of a sentence. Now, prepositional phrases, they are just that. They are phrases which are small groups of words that begin with a preposition. And T-Rex has actually created a preposition board for us. It's a really great board. Now, I will tell you, these are not all the prepositions. There are tons of prepositions, but these are probably ones that you are very familiar with and you are comfortable using them. They're even broken down into three categories to kind of help us with our lesson and guide us a little bit. So our location prepositions, I like to think of these as my hide and seek prepositions. So if I was going to suggest good hiding places for you, I would probably say behind the couch or maybe even below a table, that way nobody sees you. Our time prepositions. I like to think of these as our storytelling prepositions because they just kind of fall into place naturally whenever you're telling a story or having a conversation. Uh, maybe if I wanted to talk about the weather outside, I would say something like it was cloudy before the rainstorm. But then later I might come back and say that uh, there was a lot of sunshine after the rain. Our last category is our movement category. And for me, when I think of the movement category, I think about action. I think about a lot of stuff going on. It's a very busy category. So when I think about movement prepositions, I see kids who are going down the stop, a slide or maybe going up a tree. I see my students who are running toward the playground so that they can go out and have a good time. Oh, look, we have another question. Yes. Another great question. Why do we use prepositions and prepositional phrases? Well, two reasons, really. One is for clarity and understanding. Like, I could tell you to take my laser pointer and put it in my office, but my office is kind of a big place, so that's not very specific, and it's a little unclear as to where I want you to put it. But if I ask you to put my laser pointer in my office by my computer, that's very specific. I have created clarity for you, and hopefully I've created understanding of the expectation. Now, the other reason that we use it, I'm gonna be honest with you, prepositions are just fun. They make things interesting. As my students in my classroom say, prepositions make things spicy. We love spicy, right? Oh, okay, I didn't know. T-Rex says he actually has a couple of pictures that we can use to kind of test out ourselves and, and see how we're doing with prepositions. Do you guys wanna try? Good, good, good. Take a look at our first picture then. 
I'm going to go ahead and get you started. And I'd like for you to finish the description of the picture by using a prepositional phrase. So in this picture, I see a man who is going, yes, beautiful, up the stairs. Great job. Let's take a look at our second picture. I like this picture. It's a fun picture. This is a picture of a man who is, yes, he is hiding behind the bushes. Excellent. Love it. Let's take a look at picture number three. Now, take your time with picture number three because there's a lot going on in this picture. And there are plenty of opportunities to identify prepositional phrases. So don't rush, take some think time and go ahead and look at this picture. When you're ready and you think that you have a good description using a prepositional phrase, go ahead and give me a thumbs up and I'll know that you're ready to go on. I know this is such a fun lesson. I'm having such a good time. Okay, so I see a couple of thumbs up. Thank you very much. Okay, looks like we're kind of in the right page. Let's go ahead and wrap up in five, four, three, two, and one. Anybody wanna give me a suggestion of a prepositional phrase that they wanna to use to describe this picture? Okay, yes, we can very, yes, we can totally say that. So in this picture, we can say that the clouds are above the ground. And I'm gonna go ahead and write this because I have a feeling you guys are gonna come up with some really good things. So the clouds are above the ground. Excellent. So what is the preposition that you're using? Okay, above, excellent. What about the entire prepositional phrase? Fantastic. So above the ground is our prepositional phrase. Any other suggestions? Yes. Oh, I like how you just kind of twisted that. That's really good. I love it. So instead of saying the clouds are above the ground, we could do that. We could say that the ground is below the sky. Excellent. The ground is below the sky. I really love how you're taking the chance to describe basically the same thing, but you're just putting a little twist on it to use a different preposition. Now, which preposition did you use? Yes, below is our preposition. And what about, yes, our prepositional phrase, great job, below the sky, love it. Any others? Yes, excellent. We could use a movement preposition and we could say that the river is running toward the trees. I love that, kiss your brain. I love when we're able to use our movement or our action prepositions. Great job. You see, you guys really are good at this. I had a feeling that you would be and some of you are prepositional pros. I love it. Oh. Gosh, what a bummer, guys. I don't know if you can hear that, but that's my timer going off. That tells me that I need to get ready for PE and my outdoor activities. So thank you so much for letting me stop by and work on prepositions and prepositional phrases with you. Don't forget, when you're at home and you're reading your books and your magazines, look for those prepositions and prepositional phrases. When you're journaling or maybe you're writing or emailing, Try to use them. Challenge yourself to be more specific or just to be spicy and use prepositions and prepositional phrases. And of course, identify them in your conversations. Okay, guys, I don't want to be late for PE, so I better go. Now, T-Rex says if you have some time, stick around for a few more minutes because he has some prepositional picks that he wants to share with you to kind of expand your, your knowledge and your experience with prepositions. I had a really great time, guys, and I hope that we can do this again soon. You guys be safe. Take care. Talk to you later. Hi, I'm Miss Stratton. I'm a blended teacher for St. Tammany Parish, Parish Public School System, and I'm going to do a number shape obstacle course today. So, parents, you'll need to do this ahead of time for your child with some just with some sidewalk chalk. You can do it on the sidewalk. I live on a cul-de-sac, so it's easy to do it on my cul-de-sac. You could do it in your driveway. It's just a fun and easy um, activity for the kids to do. So, we're going to start right here. I have a little start box. So obviously, it's a rectangle, and we're going to count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right here, I'm gonna run. 
I'm going to clap five times. One, two, three, four, five. Square, circle, triangle, rectangle. Uh-oh, this is a cylinder and a sphere. I'm going to run. I'm going to jump five times. One, two, three, four, five. And here comes the challenger part. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. I'm going to run. I'm going to spin. Run. Spin. Run. Spin. Run. Spin. And I'm finished. Yay. If you would like to see more of these fun and exciting activities, join us on St. Tammany Parish Public School t Channel. Thanks a lot. Bye, guys. Good morning, St. Tammany Parish School friends. My name is Mrs. Nelson, and I teach kindergarten at St. Tammany Parish. And before we begin, I just wanted to um, let you know that you can check out some cool videos at stpsb.org. Um, some more videos about math and reading and science and just some fun things to pass the time while we're inside being safe and healthy. Today, I prepared just a little science experiment that you can do at your home. You need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight glasses. It doesn't matter what size or what shape. As you can see, I have different sizes and shapes here. You will need something to hold water so you can pour and get different levels in each glass. And if you want, would like, you can add food coloring just to make it pretty. And then you'll need a metal spoon. And the objective in this experiment is to be able to get the right amount of water in each glass so that when you hit each glass, you'll hear the notes in the scale. Okay, so a scale has eight notes in it from the first to the, to the last note, and we're gonna see if we can hear those when I hit them. Now, it takes a little bit of time to get the right amount of water, and I'm gonna tell you the secret after we listen to it. And then we can go down the scale. Okay, and the secret is, if you notice, this is a lower note, it has more water in it. And with the different shapes, you have to kind of experiment and test out um, how much water you need for the note that you want to make. And if you need to use a piano or some other instrument to check and make sure you've got your scale correct, you can ask your older brother or sister, maybe your mom or dad can help you out with that. And um, once you get all your glasses together, you and your family can make music with your glasses. If you just keep them in, in the row so that you know where each note is at, you could play Mary Had a Little Lamb. or you can just use your imagination and make up your own new song. So just remember, you need your eight glasses, your water at different levels. If you have it high, it's gonna be a low note. If you have less water, it's gonna be a higher note. And it just depends on what kind of glass you use. I hope you have fun, be careful, be safe, and we'll see you later. Bye.
My name is Stephanie Russo, and I'm a math teacher for St. Tammany Parish Public Schools. Today, I'm going to show you an example of how to play a math game with an adult to practice addition, subtraction, and multiplication facts. For this activity, you can take an egg carton and two objects to shake inside. I am using two pom-poms today, but you can use dry beans, candy, or tiny rocks, for example, to shake inside of it. Label each crate 1 through 12 and place your two objects inside and start shaking it up. Our objects landed on 3 and 7. We can use addition to add 3 plus 7. We can subtract 7 minus 3 and we can multiply 7 times 3 or 3 times 7. Close the lid and shake it up again. This time try it with me. They landed on 9 and 5. Can you help me add 9 plus 5? 14. Let's subtract. 9 minus 5 equals 4. And let's try those math facts. 9 times 5 equals 45. Great job. I hope you enjoyed learning how to play this math game. Have fun trying it out with an adult at home. I'm Brian Donnelly, a PE teacher in St. Tammany Parish. Today, I've invited one of our music teachers, Mr. McCord, to help collaborate with a fitness lesson. Mr. McCord is going to teach us a little bit about rhythm and reading music, and then we are going to come up with some upper body fitness movements to match those rhythms. Should be a lot of fun. You ready to go? Take it away, maestro! Hey, my name is Mr. McCord. I'm a music teacher in St. Tammany. Right now, we're going to make some workout rhythms with our coach. The first workout rhythm that we're going to use is just four quarter notes in a row. A quarter note gets one beat. And to say them, I teach my kids, we say ta, so, ta, 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 ta. And we play them just like this. McCord. I think the best place to start for us is our regular push-ups or a variation like a knee push-up. Now let's examine those notes. Ta, 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 ta. How do you think we can work those notes into our push-up? Think about it. What I'm thinking is that maybe each note will tell us when we bend and straighten our elbow. So that's going to control us moving down and up. So it'll be down, up, down, up. You ready to give it a try? Let's get in our push-up positions. All right, Maestro, play us the notes. We're going to do each rhythm two times, so don't get out of your push-up position after the first one. This next rhythm, we're going to use those quarter notes again, but we also have two eighth notes in this rhythm. Eighth notes actually take up half a beat, but when you put them together, like right here, they take up one full beat. I teach my kids to say eighth notes as ta di, so let's read this rhythm ta, ta, ta di, ta, and you play it just like this. Ta, 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 ta. That's a little quicker. We're going to have to bend and straighten our elbows a little faster on those eighth notes. Y'all ready to give it a try? Let's get into our push up position. And let's go. Ta, ta. Ta ti ta. Hold it. Ta 
ta, 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 ti, ta. All right, we're ready for the third. All right, let's send Coach another rhythm. For this rhythm, I'm using two very different notes. They are called half notes. Half notes are longer than quarter notes and eighth notes. Half notes take up two beats, even though it's one note. I tell my kids to say two, two, when they play a half note. Two, two, and it sounds just like this. Half notes, huh? Well, two, two. Boys and girls, what do you think that is going to do to our push-ups? Think about it. If you're thinking that that means we're going to have to stay in the down position a lot longer, you're thinking the same thing as I am. You ready to get to it? Remember, we're doing it twice. Let's get in our push-up positions. All right, Maestro. Two, two. All right, let's see what else you have. All right, we have one more rhythm for coach. Let's go back to our eighth notes and quarter notes. A lot of eighth notes in here, and the last one's a quarter note. Can you say it with me, ta and ta di? Ready? Ready? Go. Ta di, ta di, ta di, ta. And it sounds just like this. Those eighth notes again. Boys and girls, do you remember the eighth notes? Those are the ta ti, the fast notes. How is that going to affect our push up? Let's think about it. That's right, we're going to be moving up and down a little more quickly. You guys ready to try? Let's get to it. Remember, we're doing it twice. All right, you ready? Hit it, Maestro. Ta ti ta ti ta ti ta. Ta ti ta ti ta ti ta. All right, what else we got? All right, now let's do all of our workout rhythms in a row. I'm gonna play each rhythm that we learned. I'm gonna play each one twice. Do the workout move after you hear the rhythm. Ready? Wait, all of them in a row? That certainly is a challenge. Boys and girls, are you up for it? I think we can do it. Let's get in our push-up positions. All right, play it. Here's our first one. Ta, 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 ta. Ta, 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 ta. Ta, 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 ta. Two, two. Two, two. Ta ti, ta ti, ta ti, ta. Ta ti, ta ti, ta ti, ta. Wow, what a great job doing push-ups, boys and girls. I am very proud. Now, push-ups aren't the only way to build upper body strength. 
There are lots of other things we can do to make our shoulders, chest, and arms strong. One of the things I like to do in class is assign certain songs to certain exercises. And we're going to do something similar here. We're going to assign different upper body movements for each one of the rhythms that Mr. McCord taught us. Then, when he plays them in his challenge round, we are going to match them using the rhythms I'm going to show you right now. Let's get in our push-up position. Let's say that first rhythm, boys and girls. The first rhythm Mr. McCord taught us. Here's our first one. It's going to be our basic push-up. Ta, 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 ta. That second rhythm that Mr. McCord taught us. is going to be a shoulder touch. Ta, 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 ti, ta. That third rhythm that's a little bit slower, the half notes. That's going to be a wall wave. Two, two. And that fourth rhythm Mr. McCord taught us, the fast one, is going to be hand walking. Ta, ti, ta, ti, ta, ti, ta. Now here's the maestro with the rules to his game. Challenge round. I'm going to pick different rhythms. I'm only going to play them once. Repeat the right workout move with coach after I play. Here's our first one. Ready? Okay, everyone. Let's get in our push-up position and get ready for the challenge round. Ta, ti, ta, ti, ta. Two, two. Ta, ti, ta, ti, ta, ti, ta. Ta. Ta, ta, ta. Two, two. Ta, 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 ti, ta. Ta. Ta, ta, ta. The subject for tonight's lecture is rhythm. The beat. The driving force that holds our lives together. Without rhythm, your heart wouldn't be. Without direction, without mood, and without shade. Ha! Huh. What a workout! Boys and girls, I hope you enjoyed learning about rhythm and mixing that in with our fitness today. I want to give a special thank you to Mr. McCord for collaborating with me to make this lesson possible, and a very special thank you to Ms. Hales, another St. Tammany Parish music teacher, for all of her hard work behind the scenes. If you enjoyed lessons like this, boys and girls, 
Remember, you can learn with us daily by watching the St. Tammany Parish YouTube channel. You can find the address by going to the St. Tammany Parish website. Until next time, say goodnight, Chris. This is Jane Hill, and I am here to teach you one of my favorite art projects, which is paper bag puppets. What could be cooler than that? Paper bag puppets are really easy to make. You don't need a lot of fancy materials. You're simply going to need to get paper bags. You're going to need to get Crayola crowns. You're going to need to get a pair of scissors, plenty of paper. And finally, you're going to need either Elmer's glue or a glue stick. So you might want to pause the video and just get the materials that you need here, your paper bag, crown scissors, extra paper, glue, and a glue stick, so you're ready to make your paper bag puppet. Now, I'm going to share with you a paper bag puppet that I made. Are you ready to see him? Here he is. All righty. This little guy is very jazzy and snazzy, and I hope you will notice that while he's got a very friendly face on the outside, oh, he's got very large yellow teeth on the inside. I gave him a tie, I gave him buttons, I gave him feet and arms, a little fun crown, and I even gave him little ears. On the back of him, he's got polka dots and he's colored all in. I can hardly wait to get started. You know, when I was thinking about my puppet, I was thinking, about art I have seen in Alaska. This was art that was made in the 1800s and the early 1900s, and it was art made by Alaskan tribes to help them get ready for the spring. These are shaman masks, and I'll move it a little bit so you can see it. It's kind of shiny. This is an example. This was made in Alaska, and it's carved out of wood. And it kind of reminded me of my puppet a little bit because it had arms and legs, and while I wear a puppet on my hand, this mask was actually worn on a dancer's face. If you look very closely, you can see that the mask is carved out of wood. There's two arms right here, two legs, a big face on the mask itself, a little face on top, and if you look very carefully, it's kind of hard to see with the reflection, there's two small animals placed on the mask. When I look at this mask, I can see that it's very symmetrical, it's very balanced, and simple shapes add up to create a very expressive form. I see that the shape of a circle is repeated over and over again. That's something I can think about for my mask. Masks like this 
were used in special ceremonies in the spring, early, early spring. So as the winter, cold winter ended, the mask makers, including the shaman of the tribe, would instruct these masks to be made, and they were worn in ceremonial dances to encourage animals to come back for the hunt. In fact, some art historians feel that the circles that you see here are magical holes through which the spirits of the animals will move back to come and bless the land and bless the fertility of the season. It's interesting to read all about these masks and learn more about the art from Alaska, but they're wonderful inspiration for the puppets that we're gonna make today. Both the puppets and the masks are worn on the body. Both have an element of performance and both are objects that are gonna be made using really bold, simple shapes and also symmetry and balance. If I have something on one side of my puppet, I'm gonna to need to put it on the other. That's what symmetry and balance mean. Now let's take another look at our puppet and we can learn some of the techniques we need. We'll have our paper bag and we've got brightly colored paper. Some of it's textured and some of it's just plain paper. I'm gonna encourage you to create a bunch of texture rubbings for your puppet. And for a texture rubbing, I recommend that you go ahead and get a bunch of objects you think might be nice to create a texture rubbing with. You'll take something, I have right here a leaf, and you'll get an ordinary piece of paper. And I'm just gonna take my leaf and I'm gonna put it right here. And I'm going to then get a crown and you can use whatever color you want. Peel your crown, you don't wanna use the point. And then you're gonna rub and rub and rub. And as you work, pressing very, very hard, you're finally going to get the texture or the impression of the object. Now, texture's how something feels. So when you make a texture rubbing, you can get a sense of how something feels, whether it's a brittle leaf, or let's try this soft leaf over here and see what it looks like. Let's create a texture rubbing with this. And texture rubbing is just something I have to practice with a little bit. I'm not necessarily going to get it on the first try. But I want to collect a whole bunch of texture rubbings that I can use to cut out for my puppet. It's very exciting. I'll show you some textures that I've collected. Here's a page of leaves that I've made right here. Here's some textures that I made from the rain spout outside. I laid it against the drain spout or the rain spout several times and rubbed it with a blue crown. Here is a texture that I made from the bottom of a shoe right here. And if you look really close, you see the earring I have in my ear? This is a texture rubbing I made from the earring. So get a whole bunch of texture rubbings to help you get started. You're going to use your crowns and your paper for that. Once you've got your texture rubbings ready, it's time to start thinking about your puppet. What sort of puppet do you want to have? Is this puppet going to be a person? Is it going to be a mystical figure? Is it going to be a monster? Is it going to be Spider-Man? Is it going to be some sort of spooky creature or maybe a noble hero? Is it a boy or a girl? Maybe it's a princess. Maybe it's a mix of an animal and a human. That's up to you. You have to think about your character. Who is this puppet going to be? What sort of expression do they have on their face? What do they wear? Do they have a hat? What parts of their body do you need to show? Does your puppet have wings, a tail? Don't just think when you're working of the front of your paper bag, but remember that this object has got sides and it's got a back. So you might need to think of your puppet as having things on the front, like the face, but also on the back. Now, when you start thinking about your puppet, you need to think about where your hand goes. When I take a flat paper bag like this, I notice there's a little flap right here. That's gonna be the mouth of my puppet. When I put my hand in, there we go. So I can have a face on the outside of my puppet, but I can also open up my paper bag, woo, and have a wonderful mouth that I can create. Now, the cool thing about this is thinking about shape. I've already got lots of cool texture rubbings, and I wanted to show you how different shapes look. I cut out some shapes here that I'm gonna hold up so you can get a sense of what the eye of your puppet might look like. Let's get started, let's see. I've got a huge shape here, whoa! That's really big. I like the circle shape, but that is a really, really big circle. Let's try one that's a little smaller. Let's see this guy. Now that is a little bit smaller. It doesn't overwhelm the whole face. It leaves room for other things. 
I could maybe have a big and a small circle. Ooh, that's kind of funny. A goofy eye, a smaller eye. Now those circles set up a certain feeling in my character. I wonder what he's like. But if I change the shape of my puppet, what if I had a eye shape like this or a leaf shape? That gives me a different feeling. If I put it low down, high up, if I tilt it, all of these things are gonna change the feeling of my puppet. What if I give him a big round nose like that? Ooh, let's give him a little round nose, sort of like that. Now that's starting to get kind of interesting. So how you create your puppet is up to you. If you look at the puppet that I made, I have lots of pieces of paper that are stacked. I made a basic shape for my eye. I cut out jiggity jaggedy shapes for my eyebrows and I did a lot of overlapping. So I put down a shape and then I put another shape on top and then another shape. So I have a leaf shape here, then a circle, then another little circle and a big jolly circle for the nose and a little sort of, I don't know, moon shape on the side for my smile. Then I went ahead and I cut out an arm and another arm, which I traced from the first arm added buttons, and then all of it gets glued onto the puppet. It's really very simple. So before you glue things down, you're gonna to wanna to play with the shapes. And as you're working, make sure you're thinking about shapes that are balanced and symmetrical. If you put something on one side of the puppet, like I did here, you're probably gonna to wanna to put it on the other side of the puppet. Once you're happy with how your puppet parts look, and you've got a lot of good color on there, you're gonna take your glue stick, and really thoroughly glue down the piece that you want to attach to your bag. Be thorough. Don't just put a little dip of glue on there or it's just not going to work. Let's go ahead. Ooh, I'm going to put his eye right there. That looks wonderful. And then I can open his mouth and glue teeth along here. Maybe have a big long tongue hanging out and keep adding on parts of my face until I have a fabulous puppet. It's one of the simplest and most fun projects you can do. When you're finished making your puppet, and of course you've thought about the back of the puppet, you've thought about the front of the puppet, the arms, maybe he's got feet. My puppet doesn't have wings, but maybe yours does. I think might have to make him wings. I think he'd probably enjoy that. You can give him a name and you can write a story about him. In fact, you can have a whole puppet show make a bunch of puppets, and then put on a show for your friends and family with a whole bunch of characters. You can even write a comic book about your puppet. There's so many things to do. And again, all you need are a couple of paper bags, some paper, crowns, make some texture rubbings, then get out your scissors and glue and start creating. Well, folks, I hope you've enjoyed this quick lesson on how to make a puppet out of a plain old paper bag. Go forth and make some, have a lot of fun, and I'll see you on the next video. Bye-bye.